morning from the Resilience Hub at uh, COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh. Uh, we have uh, a very interesting session today here uh, on looking at disaster and climate resilient infrastructure, pathways from risk to resilience. Uh, we are living in interesting times. Uh, the world is investing in infrastructure like never before. By some estimates, more than half the infrastructure that we will have by 2050 is yet to be built. And all of this has to be built in times of unprecedented transitions, transitions in the form of uh, energy transitions, you know, low carbon infrastructure, transition in terms of rural urban, transition in ecosystems. So in this, uh, in this time of multiple transitions, how do we invest in infrastructure systems in a manner that we build resilience as opposed to accumulating risk? So this morning with me here at the Resilience Hub, we have very eminent colleagues uh, who've been working on these issues, thinking about these issues, collaborating on these issues across the world. And it will be a great opportunity to reflect on these issues and see how we uh, take it forward, uh, take this work forward uh, across the world. So uh, to set the stage for uh, these discussions, um, uh, I would like to invite, uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Aroma Revi. He is uh, an eminent colleague and professional working on disaster risk management issues for more than 30 years. He is coordinating lead author of the special report, 1.5 report that was launched in 2018. He's also been uh, involved in the Adaptation and Resilience Report 6. Uh, he has also um, been very keenly involved in shaping the Sustainable Development Goal 11 uh, and um, has worked across a whole spectrum of uh, disaster and climate risk management issues across multiple geographies. So I'll ask him to set the stage and then on behalf of the organizers of this session, we will hear a little bit about uh, some work on risk analytics that uh, the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure is doing. Uh, but for now, the, the floor is yours, Aramar. Thank you, Kamal. I'm really glad that CDRI is bringing together a whole range of people across the spectrum in COP, because what we are seeing just now is the absolute imperative for convergence uh, on implementation uh, between the disaster risk community and the climate risk community. And this has not been easy over the last two decades or so, but I think we're seeing you know, remarkable convergence building just now. So what are the known knowns in some senses that we're trying to respond to? The first, of course, is that we've got a planet full of people. So we have 8 billion people going to 10. And we're in a planet in which risk is accumulating dramatically. And you know, I don't have to speak of COVID to be able to give people a sense of the fact that if we move from individual events or sometimes concatenated events to systemic risk. COVID is that fantastic example starting in one particular place, spreading across the world in a few weeks and months, and then essentially shutting down the global economy in many parts of the world, causing a whole range of deaths. That's more on the soft side. But why is infrastructure important? Infrastructure is important because, especially in post-COVID recovery, this is what many regions and many governments are actually counting on to actually deliver, not, on, not only on the economic development trajectory, but also on delivering the sustainable development goals. Uh, we know that you know, we haven't been doing too well on the SDGs, and COVID has really set us back. So in some ways, the delivery of infrastructure and the services that come for, from it are really important to try to accelerate not only the transition towards net zero, but also accelerate the recovery of um, the economies and livelihoods that we, we're seeing across the world. So that's, I think, the second thing that we really need to focus on. Um, and like Amal said just now, in many parts of the world, a trend which is very, very critical is we're currently at about half uh, the world population living in cities. In another 20 years or so, we'll be about two-thirds urban and one-third rural. Uh, the balance between the two is very important. But the connector between cities and rural areas, the connectors between cities and regions, the connectors within, within cities itself are infrastructures. But we have to take a wider view of infrastructure. So it's not only the conventional infrastructures which are sort of, sort of gray and maybe black in some cases, 
Uh, you know, we're talking today about energy and transport, but the wide range of other infrastructures, starting from the blue, the green, which are quite critical. And the reason that that's important is we're in a world today, like I said, with 8 billion people, which is full, and we are having the coupling of human systems, natural systems, the oceans, and the atmosphere actually providing dramatic feedbacks. And as you know from our work in the IPCC, uh, we've tried very hard to suggest that there are paths to uh, actually achieving a 1.5 sort of future world. And you know, as it is, 1.5 is going to be problematic enough. We're at 1.1, and we can see the impacts in all systems across the world. Even 0.1 degrees is quite, actually quite serious, and you've seen that even you know, recently in, in, in the impacts that we've seen in Pakistan. We've seen that over the last many years in many other parts of the world. The challenge for us is, in actual fact, if we look at how emissions are currently running, how the global economy is recovering, we are probably set uh, for an overshoot well beyond 1.5, maybe beyond 2. So the context of building resilient infrastructure is not only economic recovery, providing and enabling the SDGs all the way from you know, one which is about poverty, two that's about food, uh, you know, three and four about health and education, et cetera, and, and, and the other sort of harder infrastructures, but critically doing that in uh, a climate resilient development frame. And that's going to be extremely challenging because it means that the energy transition and all the other transitions have to be wrapped into this process. So in actual fact, it means that when, when you're looking at something like transportation, the essential thing that we've said very clearly from the IPCC is you need to electrify, right? And you need to electrify using you know, green power. So the transition to electrification is difficult enough, especially in many parts of the world where you still have 1.2 billion people that don't have access to electricity. So dealing with energy poverty in some senses is absolutely crucial. If you do not have access to modern renewable energy for everybody in the world, there's no chance that you're going to be achieve climate justice. And you are, it, you know, that's going to be a significant burden, not only on the public sector, but also on the private sector that's trying to kind of implement these kind of processes. So if you want climate justice, you have to first deal with the questions of energy poverty, universal access, and then you have to make sure that you have large enough pools of renewable energy with storage that can actually be deployed across grids to make this transition. We're seeing this happen in some parts of the world. Uh, you know, for electric, for example, electric vehicles that are happening in passenger transport, using high-speed rail building out, et cetera. So many steps forward, but there are very serious challenges. So if you look at the climate agenda, there are five big transitions that need to happen simultaneously. This is not the 1990s, the 30 years that we've lost, where you could trade off, let's say, energy uh, you know, with development. We have to do all of these five things together. The first one that seems to be moving fairly well in many parts of the world is the energy transition. Uh, and that's working because market forces are operational in some senses, but even there, there are serious uh, sort of last mile connectivity issues, there are serious institutional issues of trying to deliver uh, across the energy spectrum, because in most parts of the world, and we've seen that after the conflict in Ukraine, people are bringing back you know, fossil fuel uh, driven processes just to keep the base load up. So that's one set of questions. The problematic area actually is in the industrial transition which actually underpins many of these processes. And the reason that I'm highlighting that is, with much of urbanization to happen in many parts of Asia, including South Asia, much of Latin America and retrofitting of cities across the world to happen, the built environment is going to be absolutely crucial. Fine? And building the resilience of built environment, and this is something that I've shared with Chinese colleagues over a long period of time. China has built dramatically over the last 30 years, but if your life cycles of buildings uh, are not 50 or 60 or 70 years, you have a massive legacy then of wanting to retrofit in the 2040s and the 2050s uh, to actually get resilient and build cities. So it's not only about the services uh, at the trunk level, it's also about the services inside the buildings, inside the offices as we move to service sector economies that are important to look at. So we really need to build for a long period of time. We need to build buildings which are going to be, and, and cities that are going to be subject to tremendous risk the seismotectonic ones are pretty obvious. But the other kind of known fact, of course, is as we urbanize, we're urbanizing in places where risk is concentrated. We're urbanizing along coasts. We're urbanizing along uh, river valleys. We're urbanizing in areas where historically risk is concentrated. So you have an opportunity of economic development. You have an opportunity of plurality. You have an opportunity of, of, of innovation. But you're also concentrating risk. And many of these places also concentrate poverty and vulnerability at the same time. So for many parts of the world, and this is where I think CDRI is quite important, 
one of the critical questions is how do you actually not only you know, reduce exposure of, of infrastructure and infrastructure systems, especially the social infrastructure, but how do you actually reduce the vulnerability of those systems? So we have to raise the floor in terms of infrastructure standards. We have to raise the floor in terms of universal access. And that, for many people in the world, uh, because they live in vulnerable circumstances, they live in informal settlements, is going to be the way forward for us to actually you know, make a significant difference in their lives. And we have to do, do this at a very modest level of investment. And that's the interesting thing. The, you know, the, the infrastructures that have been built in Europe and North America, we can forget about. I would say even what China has done is something that is at a relatively high cost. For much of Sub-Saharan Africa, much of South Asia, we have to deliver this resilient infrastructure maybe at a fifth or a fourth or at least a third of the current delivery cost. And that's where institutional innovation and that's where finance is going to be absolutely critical. So the flagship report that CDRA is putting, putting out, I think, is very important in this because I think we are laying the foundations globally and in each of our regions of an analytical frame that, in a sense, is going to enable us to move the investments in the infrastructure sector from the hundreds of millions, hundreds of billions, into the trillion scale. Right? We talk about the massive infrastructure gap. It is significant. This is a macroeconomic challenge. But the infrastructure gap is not only a gap across the world, it is significantly a gap in the LDCs, even in the middle-income countries that are growing, and there the fundamental issue is risk and the cost of capital. So if your cost of capital is twice of what you'd get at LIBOR, there is no chance that the investment is going to flow uphill. And I think uh, what we're trying to do in trying to you know, build out the global risk index, uh, actually build parametric and probabilistic models, which take risk down to the locations that it's concentrated in, uh, we will, I hope, as a whole range of actors in the financial sector actually come into the game, make a significant difference to the risk premium, which the poorest uh, and now increasingly debt uh, sort of laden countries are going to deal with. Because if you do not address the questions of debt, if you do not address the questions of cost of capital and risk, uh, in effect, uh, this is going to be a hollow promise in some senses. So you cannot achieve climate resilient development. You cannot achieve uh, and implement the uh, urban and infrastructure transition unless you're able to organize and understand where risk is concentrated. And this is to be done in a systemic manner because in many parts of the world, governments do not have the resources to actually deliver on this promise, which means if they have to crowd in private sector resources, if we have to have adequate insurance cover, we have to have an understanding of how risk is organized unbundled, and we have to have institutional responses in the financial system, in the governance system, to make it possible. And this is across the spectrum. Blue and green infrastructures, because cities cannot survive without water, uh, without food, without all the core things that they don't actually have. You have to obviously do that as far as the hard infrastructures are concerned, energy, telecom, transport, et cetera, the things that we're talking about today. But we should not forget education and health, because it's education and health that fundamentally reduces the vulnerability, which allows the capacity to build, be built within civil society, communities, uh, and, and in local governments to actually respond to these questions. So in some senses, there is a significant expectation from this report because it will touch on the science and the analytics. It will touch uh, on the way that industry and the financial institutions actually look at this uh, in this big survey that you know, we're actually trying to put together. Uh, it will look at so-called nature-based solutions and green and blue. And then most critically, it will try and chart a pathway in terms of looking at finance because Without the finance, uh, this is going to be something that we'll be talking about uh, till the 2030s or the 2040s. Because I can tell you from the science, we are probably going to see a 1.5 to 2 degree overshoot, and we have to finance in that context. So the energy transition and resilience have to be financed simultaneously. And actually, we have to find a way in which there's no trade-off between these two processes, because that will be disastrous, both for the energy transition and also for the delivery of services, and finally for uh, improvement of welfare, which the SDGs are in some, some ways uh, sort of lay out. So uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here. We have a wonderful panel, and I think it will be fantastic to hear from our colleagues who are actually doing the analytical work uh, and having the serious challenges of trying to build uh, this thing for the world. I mean, we've done it in our individual countries, but you have to build it for the world, because if the resources don't flow, uh, all of this stuff in some senses, is something that we can talk about, uh, but it'll never go to implementation. So thank you so much, Kamal.
Uh, thank you very much, Arumar. You highlighted the uh, complexity of the challenge before us and its many dimensions. How do we close the infrastructure gap? How do we provide basic infrastructure services to people who have never had it? How do we address energy poverty and do it in a cost-efficient manner, take a long view of things so that we don't build infrastructure which is sort of legacy infrastructure which needs to be retrofitted later? And how do we ensure that we raise the floor in terms of reducing vulnerability of infrastructure systems, look at where infrastructure is, infrastructure is, um, is exposed to hazards, uh, current hazards and emerging hazards, and where are the concentrations of risk and how do we um, begin to invest in resilience. With that, uh, let's see um, uh, a summary view of uh, some of the work that CDRI is doing in terms of risk analytics. And I would now invite our colleagues from uh, Engineer, uh, Gabriel, and from Chima Foundation, Roberto. Uh, they'll join us virtually to present some of the preliminary findings of the work uh, that CDRI is doing on looking at disaster and climate risk to infrastructure systems across the world. Well, hi, hi everyone. I mean, for the thing records, actually, I will start. I mean, saying a few words before Gabriel. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, if you want to switch on, on me, <laughs> thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm hello. I'm Roberto Rudari from Program Director at Chima Research Foundation, and uh, coordinating a little bit this effort about the Global Infrastructure Resilience Index. Um, it would be nice, I mean, if you would like, I mean, to pop up the, um, the presentation uh, so that I can say a few words supported by, by graphics. Um, that would be uh, appreciated. But in the meantime, uh, to set the background, um, really, it was already, I mean, uh, said uh, repeatedly that, you know, the, 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 final, uh, the final goal for that, I mean, is really uh, to uh, to go for, um, to support the um, flagship report of CDRI on disaster and climate resilient infrastructure. Next slide, please. And uh, this is really important, I mean, to engage, I mean, uh, next uh, a global audience of political leaders, policymakers, practitioners, and researchers. Um, if you can click on next, it will appear next and next again. So. I mean, everything is on the screen. Um, and uh, actually, CDRI could have chosen like an easy way, I mean, uh, at least in my eyes. So, I mean, maybe, you know, pick and choose, I mean, from some, uh, let's say, studies and good studies and pilot studies that, you know, researchers, academy and practitioners are doing, I mean, all over the world, trying to, I mean, get key messages from there and actually go for building a report in a sort of a more patchy way Instead, they decided that to invest in something, I mean, much more ambitious, and to invest in a, in a global infrastructure risk model that, I mean, will lead us, I mean, to support the Global Infrastructure Resilience Index uh, building, and in turn, you know, the, inform the flagship, the flagship report. And this has a big advantage. I mean, it's a big endeavor, but, I mean, it has a big advantage because it will leave us, I mean, with... Um, like an effort with, uh, that uh, has like a methodological homogeneity all across the world, not only in terms of methodology, but also in terms of metrics. Next. And um, so we are gonna have like basically, I mean, working on two pillars, I mean, here. So one, pillar one is the global infrastructure risk model that I mean, which will be explained by Gabriel, I mean, uh, in a bit. And pillar two, next that is the Global Infrastructure Resilience Index. So, I mean, those two, I mean, pieces of information will be, I mean, will constitute the basis, I mean, for, let's say, the messages that the flagship reports. So we feel the pressure of that, I mean, uh, definitely. But we have a very good team, next, that is working on that, like a full partnership with very clear and um, identified, I, mean, I would say, skills and responsibilities within the consortium. So the Chima Research Foundation, that is a consortium lead, it has the responsibility, I mean, very relevant for the, the, the COP now, I mean, for addressing the climate change issue and some of the most important hydromet, I mean, hazards like floods and droughts. 
We have Ingenieur Risk Intelligence, represented by Gabriel, a bit that is the technical lead and uh, is sharing, you know, the majority of, I would say, the, the responsibilities in terms of not only building the hazard models for tropical cyclone, earthquake, tsunami, and the exposure model, but also for mixing these up into the risk computation and then supporting the GRE index um, design. We have um, the Norwegian Geological Institute, I mean, uh, that is responsible for the landslides model. And in the end, I mean, the UNEP Grid University of Geneva that I mean, uh, performs the exposure computation. And also it will be responsible for the dissemination platform that uh, basically will post, I mean, all the results and metrics, I mean, uh, for this, uh, of this project. Next. Yeah, but we had like a very, and we still have like a tight roadmap. I mean, we kicked off in uh, November 21st. So, I mean, one year uh, as of now, uh, where, I mean, in this one, one year, we developed like the risk model. We are just finalizing that. We are here in November 22 with a, the finalization of that. We need, I mean, to consolidate the GRI and the risk metrics, I mean, by February 2022, so that we will enable, I mean, uh, the report, I mean, to be informed and delivered in the time frame of September 2022. So we are really, I mean, hoping that, I mean, this roadmap, I mean, um, is working. And we did, like, I mean, our milestone check, I mean, recently, I mean, in a very uh, productive meeting uh, um, in Italy. And I mean, we think, I mean, uh, we are really um, complying, I mean, with this roadmap. So in, in the next few months, I mean, we, we're gonna have like uh, uh, the complete uh, risk model, I mean, ready, and also the jury, I mean, so the index, I mean, uh, available to be, uh, to be shared. But I don't wanna lose any more time. And uh, I mean, we have Gabriel that will lead us, I mean, into already, I mean, biting, I mean, to some pieces of the of the risk model and first results, and also, you know, the idea of that is the stance behind, you know, the jury, the jury index. Gabriel, floor is yours. Thank you, Roberto. <clears throat> Good morning to everyone. Uh, next, please. I'm very glad to be here with you today to show you a summary of the modeling framework and some preliminary results of, of the GIRI. Um, it is very hard to summarize this huge effort in such a short time, but I'll, I'll do my best. Next, please. Uh, to give some context, um, GIRI is both a metric and a modeling framework to account for disaster risk of the infrastructure systems that support socioeconomic activities. Uh, the, both the modeling, um, the model and the and the index will account for disaster risk in a fully probabilistic way, uh, delivering probabilistic metrics that incorporate climate change in a way that is very interesting and novel, which is through imprecise probability estimates. Also, Giri incorporates socioeconomic context variables so that we can aggravate disaster risk from this context to capture the complex nature of disaster risk, of course, and then to provide a country's resilience performance indicator or metric. Next, please. Next. We're covering multiple hazards, earthquakes, tsunamis, but also landslides, floods, tropical cyclones, and droughts. These last four uh, modified by climate change, which means that we will have uh, a view of different uh, ways in which these hazards manifest under different trajectories of greenhouse gases emissions. And this is very relevant for the, for the project and for the, um, for the final result and the final construction of the, of the GIRI. Next. The sectors that we're covering are power, highways and railways, transportation, water and wastewater, communications, no. oil and gas, but also I can, I can. social infrastructure, the one that uh, Aromar was, was very um, emph emph emphatic on, on highlighting, education, health, and housing. My These are also very relevant for the, for the, for the assessment. Speak right after them, Next. Than me. Okay. 
The risk assessment model is composed on uh, hazard models that are based on um, a scenario-based approach, which means a collection of events that are mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive, and that represent all the ways in which the hazard is going to manifest in the territories. The exposure is the location, uh, characteristics, and uh, valuation price, the placement cost, actually, of the components of the infrastructure systems that are vulnerable and the vulnerability is quantified through vulnerability functions that relate hazard intensity and the cost of damage for each one of those individual components. We combine this using a catastrophe risk uh, assessment framework. Of course, some of those hazards are going to be modified by climate change to give us these different um, variations in the, in the intensities due to the trajectories of greenhouse gases emissions. And with, this, with all this uh, modeling framework, we can compute risk metrics such as the average around loss, the loss exceedance curve, or the probable maximum loss curve that at the end we're going to summarize into a functionality versus time plot to account for the uh, resilience performance of each country in the world. Next, please. Uh, we have some preliminary results. All this is uh, currently ongoing work. Uh, but I have some things here that, that uh, I can show you so you can give an idea of all the work that has been already done. Um, this is a, a flood hazard map uh, for the domains that are already completed. Uh, of course, the, the hazard models are event-based, but of course, this is more easy to see in a compiled global map like this one. Next, please. We also have these four uh, tropical cyclones. As you can see here, the tropical cyclone models also incorporate a storm surge. Next, please. Um, we have already um, hazard models for earthquakes. Next. And for uh, tsunami. And the other hazards, of course, also as well. But um, I mean, in, in, the, in the benefit of time, I didn't include everything in the presentation. Next, please. In terms of exposure, we're applying a combined top-down and bottom-up approach. For the top-down part of the approach next, we are using, um, we're quantifying like different bags of money for each country that are, uh, we start with the total country wealth of the country next. And then that total country wealth is subdivided into produced capital, natural capital, and intangible capital. And the produced capital is then subdivided into the value of buildings, machinery and land, and infrastructure. So this gives us a very efficient, very simple, but very efficient and important way to account for the total value of the stock of buildings and infrastructure for each country. Next. And then we combine this with the bottom-up approach that gives us the possibility to distribute this value in all the different components that make up the um, infrastructure systems of each country in the world. Next. This is just a, a little example. As I mentioned, all this work is currently ongoing, but just to give you an idea, this is the aggregated exposed value of uh, the housing sector for all countries in the, in the world so far generated. Next, please. In terms of the vulnerability model, we are uh, using a very interesting and novel approach based on archetypes of infrastructure components. Next. These archetypes are general models of different types of elements or components of the infrastructure systems. For example, thermal power plants, uh, airports, refineries, uh, wastewater treatment plants, and so on. This is only to give you an idea, an example. And each one of these, of these archetypes has subcomponents, has things that make it up in terms of constructions, equipment, machinery, and so on, that are going to be suffering and are going to be damaged differently depending on their own condition within the archetype um, once the, the hazard events manifest in the model. Next, please. So these, these subcomponents uh, add different quantities of vulnerability to the full archetype vulnerability in enabling us to capture the the general behavior of the archetype in different vulnerability functions for different types of um, hazards like the ones that I'm, I'm showing here in this slide. Next. 
once we have all these com uh, components, all these ingredients for risk, um, we can compute risk using a catastrophe risk, using the catastrophe risk assessment framework that I showed a few slides earlier. And we have some preliminary figures for the housing sector. You can see here the average annual loss in relative terms uh, for cyclone, next, but also for floods. You see the, the, the distribution of the loss in the different countries. Next, please. For earthquakes as well. Next. And for tsunami. And we're, we have other results, but it's not going to be possible to show everything in this, in this session. So this is only to give you an idea of, of the huge amount of work that has been already completed in this, in this assignment. Next, please. Also, we can zoom into different countries, for example, Chile, and we can look at the distribution of risk in a subnational level, but also for the different sectors uh, considered in the calculation. This is for earthquakes, next. And this is, for example, for floods. So at the end, we end up with these country profiles that give us further information on um, for, for, uh, for a subnational comparison of the of the distribution and concentration of risk. Next, please. Finally, we uh, define the, um, the GIDI, the Resilience Index. And for that, we are building a functionality versus time uh, indicator plot. This is, a, this is built on indicators. So that, next please, um, the risk that we compute is basically the shock, the disturbance, the impact. And we then quantify the capacity to absorb the impact of the country that depends on the, on the risk assessment, of course, on the risk metrics, but also depends on the capacity to, to anticipate, the capacity to prevent, to withstand damage that, that the country has. And we are going to quantify this capacity by using different indicators that reflect on that capacity. Next, please. Then on the... Um, on the post-event degraded state, we quantify the capacity to respond from, for each country using indicators that reflect preparedness, that reflect um, capacity to, to efficiently um, mobilize resources, to cope, to, to, uh, um, to show, to show uh, uh, ability to, to perform, um, to provide, um, I'm sorry, um, to provide, uh, I, I missed the, the, the idea, to provide um, redundancy and to provide service continuity. That's it, sorry. So this, this, all these in indicators reflect on this capacity and allow us to account for such, um, for such a part portion of the, of, the, of the diagram. Then next please. On the restorative state and the post-restoration state, we are going to use different indicators to reflect on the capacity of the country to, um, to have a, a rapid response, to have a rehabilitation, to have some transformation after the occurrence of the event. Next, please. At the end, the, the GIDI, it's going to be a normalized relationship between the area and the perimeter of this plot here in the, in the screen. Next. So this means that um, at the end of the day, we're going to compute an index for all the territories in the world. Next. And then to um, also provide the, the plot, the functionality versus time uh, indicator plot that gives or that builds on the value of the, of the GIDI that we are going to be generating. At the end, this is going to work as a comparison metric among territories and also at the subnational level based on this, on this uh, resilience framework that we're using for the definition of what GIDI is going to be. Next, please. So to summarize, uh, GIDI will provide an operational picture of risk, therefore improving risk knowledge and resilience. Um, an overall risk and resilience landscape will be useful for comparisons and rankings among countries. It is important to say that this assessment incorporates events that have not occurred yet. 
as Roberto mentioned, in a harmonized way for the, for the globe and not all the historical events. Also, we're providing the correct arithmetic to make these calculations. So it is possible to go from the global scale, which is as far as, as Giri goes, into uh, any local scale as required, which what I'm trying to say is that at the end, the countries and the territories must carry out their own risk assessments with high resolution at subnational and local levels, but using the same approach, using the same uh, arithmetic and using the same metrics so that at the end, the common language is the same for everybody. Next. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, I hope this was a clear presentation. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Gabriel and Roberto, for that uh, overview of global infrastructure risk model and resilience index. Uh, you uh, got a good overview of the quantitative work uh, that is being done. There is another important dimension of it is looking at what is the quality of infrastructure governance, uh, because that determines the resilience of infrastructure systems as well. And as part of this team, uh, that work is being led by a very eminent colleague from Oxford, Professor Jim Hall. Uh, he is undertaking, uh, he and his team is undertaking a global survey of uh, how infrastructure systems are currently governed. So I'll invite him to give us a quick overview of uh, this stream of work as well. Thank you very much indeed. And I, maybe I'll stand up here. Um, I wonder also, in terms of pressing the slides, is there a clicker I can use? Um, thanks. Making sure the rest of the panel don't fall asleep this morning. Um, okay, good morning, everyone. And um, what I'm going to present is uh, really a complement to uh, what we've just heard from um, Roberta and Gabrielle and uh, to uh, the whole process of quantified risk assessment, um, which was explained so well there um, by um, the, the team generating the jury. Um, and what we learned from that is that um, the overall framework for quantified uh, climate and natural hazard risk assessment is really quite well established, this combination of um, probabilistic analysis of hazards um, combined with uh, exposure data and there's a proliferation of that type of data in a very, very exciting way, which we've been discussing in a number of sessions here at COP27. Um, and then crucially, however, the um, factors that determine vulnerability, um, the sensitivity of uh, the built environment, infrastructure, communities, nature, um, to hazards when they materialize, and the factors that determine the capacity of those systems to cope and recover once they've been struck by a hazard. Um, and as um, we, we already heard, those factors which determine coping capacity, recovery, the ability to build back better, um, are much more to do with um, institutional factors, qualitative factors, um, which are difficult to access in quantified risk assessment. And so that is the, the focus of this survey, um, which uh, I jumped over the credits there, but it's being, uh, the, all of the work is being done really um, by a researcher in my team, Nicholas Chow, um, and with incredible assistance um, from uh, CDRI, who are, um, uh, who are managing the, the, the promotion and the administration of this survey, which I should emphasize is no mean feat. Um, so uh, he, here it is, and as I say, it, uh, CDRI has been a fantastic partner, enabling us to, uh, to, to reach um, all of the world. Um, but as you will hear, in a sense, this presentation is, is also an exhortation for us to keep working on this in the coming weeks and months and um, reach even further and faster. Um, the survey is uh, global in its scope and ambition. It's been translated into 
uh, six languages to enable that global scope. Um, and it is focused in the first instance on technical people, um, people working within the infrastructure sectors who have insights into these questions around design standards, uh, governance, enforcement, maintenance, um, and so on. And um, that is in a, try, seeking to enable us to, to develop a global picture of how those crucial factors come together. Um, I should add that it's being followed um, by a non-expert survey aimed, by, aimed at members of the general public um, to um, express their lived experiences of infrastructure and infrastructure failure and recovery, but that's still to come. Um, these are the, uh, the, the infrastructure sectors um, that we're, we're looking at, and that's um, aligned with what's being covered um, in the uh, Geary. Um, though the focus here on economic infrastructure, um, more so than the, um, than the built environment and the social infrastructure. And the way the, the, the survey is, is done in a uh, survey platform, and the way in which it navigates the, uh, the user through the survey is first to, um, to get some background information in terms of their um, expertise um, and where they, where they come from, what their perspective is. Um, then the next set of questions is around um, their experience and um, perceptions of uh, uh, hazards, um, so the hazards to which the infrastructure for which they're responsible is exposed, what experience do they have of um, hazard frequency, hazard impacts, um, and then going into these questions um, around all of those factors of infrastructure management which um, determine um, the, uh, the resilience, the response, the recovery, um, and these are the pieces of information which are, are much more difficult to obtain from global data sets, and that's what this survey is really here to enable us to get. So far, um, thanks to the, um, the, the big push by CDRI, um, we've managed to get almost 600 responses. Um, so that's um, pretty good, and there's a, uh, a pretty good um, spread across sectors, um, though uh, possibly less in the energy sector than we would um, expect given the size of the sector. Um, and, uh, but then when you begin to slice that down in terms of geographical spread, we have a, a good geographical spread, um, but not nearly enough so far in terms of um, uh, the, the spread we would need in order to come up with um, robust survey uh, results. So, um, again, a real um, big push in the coming um, weeks to try and get this survey um, out further and to, uh, to learn more about infrastructure. So just a, a, a quick look at the preliminary results. And um, these are, as I say, pre preliminary based on a, um, a, a large sample, but probably not large enough. Um, but what we're seeing, and the ones at the top here are the, uh, the aspects which our respondents have, have emphasized um, so far as being particularly important, um, is the importance of the, of the overall policy framework. These are complex systems, but to have an overall sense of direction within that complex environment um, is extremely important. Um, Disaster preparedness and response planning is absolutely crucial to that process of, of response and recovery. Um, so the resistance of infrastructure is important, um, but, and we've seen this also in quantified risk assessment, the amount of time it takes to um, repair and recover is absolutely fundamental to this scale, overall scale of economic and societal impacts. Um, Dedicated infrastructure resilience financing. Interesting to see this coming up um, high at the moment because it's, um, I would say that it's still a, a fairly um, niche aspect of financing. It's being pushed um, very hard by financial institutions, including the World Bank. Um, and so they'll be pleased to see um, that, infra that dedicated infrastructure finance is, is up there as a priority. And perhaps less surprising, 
um, maintenance um, standards and practices are absolutely fundamental in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the ongoing resilience of existing infrastructure asset base. And um, you can, can see the, the, the rest of the topics that are coming up here. Um, some uh, statistical data, um, which sectors don't um, yet engage in routine preventive maintenance. Um, in a sense, um, I would say that uh, the, um, uh, the, the answers here are, are not very surprising. It's, um, uh, we know that preventative maintenance is, um, uh, is by far the most efficient way of ensuring infrastructure resilience, and yet um, the majority of sectors are not engaging in preventative maintenance. This is um, reactive maintenance is going on here, fricting problems when they occur, rather than using monitoring and technology um, to anticipate those problems. Um, the uh, interesting to see um, uh, drinking water up there um, as, as being a, a particular area of, uh, of, of weakness. Um, nonetheless, um, uh, sectors collecting and using it, data to inform decision making, um, we would expect to see this. Um, and I think in some senses we're in, encouraged by this. Um, the, the, the rail sector, as in most countries, a highly regulated sector, um, I think is, is, again, not surprising to see that up there as the, uh, the underlining the use of data in informing decision making. And this gives um, a bit of a picture of some of the emerging themes and alongside the quantitative data results, we have um, some narrative statements People are writing things um, in snapshots, snippets of information about what they're seeing. And so these are some of the snippets of information that we're, um, that we're getting from our respondents um, around material quality compromises, bureaucratic processes, shifting investment priorities. Um, uh, these are, are, are worrying, but for those of us who, who work in infrastructure, perhaps um, not actually all that um, surprising. But really strong messages here, I think, coming through for CDRI in terms of what needs to be emphasized in their um, reporting and guidance coming forwards. So that's a, a, a very quick overview of where we've got to with this survey. Um, clearly, um, the, the, this is work in progress. We haven't got enough responses yet. Um, and so please, if you haven't already done so, um, uh, within, we have, a, of course, here at COP, a number of senior people from influential organizations, and we really encourage you to dig deep into your organizations to encourage the, the, the people who are at the coalface, who are hands-on with infrastructure, to, to go into this survey and to, to fill it out, in particular, where you have um, reach around the world, in particular, the most vulnerable countries around the world. Um, please encourage that. Um, and uh, as I say, what this will give us is some both overall insights into the factors that determine infrastructure resilience, which CDIRI will be able to emphasize and come up with solutions to in the future. Um, some sense of cross-country comparison. We need to approach this with caution. Um, but it will help to build up the picture because this is what we, we need if we're going to use the quantified risk analysis which so many people are progressing so fast at the moment, it needs to be colored by this qualitative insights into the, uh, the status of infrastructure resilience. And as I say, the step beyond this, um, and a step which I'm, I'm very, very interested in as well, is to see what, to what extent can we crowdsource from the general public their lived experiences of infrastructure and help that to inform our understanding of infrastructure resilience as well. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Jim Hall. That was a re really nice uh, compliment to uh, the work that was presented earlier. In, in a sense, it's the you know, story that lies underneath what, what the quanti quantified assessment of risk and resilience is 
is finding. Some of the findings are counterintuitive, others are confirmation. So again, I would, uh, through this platform, I'll make a request for more experts to, to take the survey. I think 600 is already quite impressive, but perhaps not enough. So we are uh, running hugely behind schedule, but I want to hear from colleagues from the financial sector about financial risk metrics, and then uh, we go over to colleagues online as well. Jan Kallet, the f floor is yours. Jan is from UNDP, longtime friend and colleague, working on uh, financial risk management for disaster resilience. Thank you, Kamal, and a uh, pleasure to be here today. Um, what I'm going to do is look at this from a development perspective. Uh, so for those who don't know, I lead UNDP's work on insurance and risk finance around the world. I'm partly looking at it from a development perspective because I realize that uh, as our work grows in this space, uh, I'm, I'm increasing the ignorance of so many things. Uh, so uh, what I want to do is focus on really what we do. And what I think I'd first say right at the start is that I can immediately see so many applications for this well beyond even infrastructure. So that's actually what I'm going to talk about is how we could imagine uh, beyond that. So th I think the first thing just noting here is microphone a little bit in and out. No. Um, you know, what is the task before us and can this work actually help? So less than 1% of all institutional assets go into infrastructure. So, well, that's a bit of a problem there uh, when it comes to what you were saying, uh, Kamal. Uh, we know that there's a $15 trillion gap in infrastructure projects. Can this work, can this project actually be used as an evidence tool to strip away some of the uncertainty so actually we can have more going into uh, infrastructure? I think secondly, just the very basics of how this work is on the one hand um, improving the quality of um, actual infrastructure projects themselves. Uh, so on the one hand, making them more resilient to risk, which is likely to increase their expenditure, but over time, as I think you were su suggesting, Kamal, reduce the operational expenditure of keeping those assets in place. That's a massive, massive issue, and that's a great value of this project. But of course, also how those projects are built, where they're built, how they interact with the built environment, with the natural environment, that's also a way in which they can reduce risk as well. And I hope that project is, uh, that the project is leading into that. Third point, um, this is where we start to go into the other areas of development and, and, uh, and areas which I think is critical, which is uh, making sure that it is fully integrated in all the ways in which countries, if you like, deliver uh, financing, uh, public services, and development. Of course, the, the most obvious one is land use policy, uh, you know, how, dictating where things are built and how they're built. Um, but I'm thinking of other things. I'm thinking about um, you know, preparedness and recovery from disaster, improving insurance products and their delivery. What about public financial management integrated into public financial management and into public financial management decision making? That's a massive gap in many countries around the world. Um, and then even in starting to look at even a slightly bit beyond these areas. What about NDCs, informing NDCs? What about national adaptation plans, uh, integrated national financing frameworks? All the ways in which countries are already trying to tackle climate risk, but perhaps with not with the necessary evidence to do so in the appropriate way and the way which actually can drive change. And then also finally, there's a, even a bit of, a, my final point here is also leadership on the world stage. So India at the moment is holding the presidency of the G20. There's two tracks right there, the finance track and the infrastructure track. If this project is not informing that, then I think we are making a mistake. So I'd, what I'd say is finally, uh, this is fantastic work. I'm looking to find my ways into it from a UNDP perspective and hope we can use it and mainstream it, but I do think that the potential is actually very significant indeed. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jan, for, for those uh, remarks. Uh, your last point, how does it inform uh, at the leadership level? So uh, the, the launch of the report, the launch of all of this work is timed with G20 events next year in India, so hopefully there will be that you know, cross transfer of things, and thank you for highlighting the various applications. With with that, let me turn over to Evo from uh, Swiss Re. Uh, thank you, Kamal. Uh, let let me start by uh, you know expressing my appreciation and and by commending CDRI and and the Oxford team. Uh, this is really critical work uh, to for, uh, to inform investment. I, 
natural hazard risk, uh, in particular a climate risk, uninformed investment is a bad investment. And I see uh, uh, both, by the way, from a physical risk perspective, but also from a transition uh, risk perspective. And I think we do see clear signs that investors demand more transparency about uh, risk, uh, climate risk, and, and even if it is uh, not climate risk related, uh, I think an interesting case study here is that for the first time, at least uh, from, uh, from uh, my knowledge, we saw lenders uh, for a particular infrastructure project in Nepal, uh, a hydropower dam, to demand a specific uh, climate um, earthquake risk transfer before they were willing to actually invest. Um, so I, I think there is a clear trajectory of investors becoming more alert and uh, where there's a greater demand for transparency about risk, which I think is, is a very good thing. I clearly also see the application in the context of prioritizing limited government resources in investing into adaptation infrastructure. Where do they get the best bang for, for, for the buck to reduce risk on a um, regional level, on a, on a country level? Uh, and I also see the application in terms of um, making the business case uh, for adaptation infrastructure, including nature-based solution, uh, to quantify the avoided losses um, that uh, you know the, the implementation of an adaptation infrastructure could bring about. Now, how, how do I see an application in the, inf uh, in the insurance uh, sector and insurance uh, context? So the, uh, um, the, there is a clear correlation, obviously, of reduced uncertainty will lead to a greater risk appetite and reduced uh, um, uh, charges for, for uncertainty. So to, to come to your point uh, earlier of reduced capital costs actually for the, for the investment. If I look at how we underwrite risk for infrastructure projects, it is though very much on an individual project uh, basis. So I think the further trajectory of developing uh, the models to be applicable of individual risk will be important. Um, but where, also, where I see currently an, an, an application is um, network infrastructure such as rails, uh, roads. That's something we are struggling with. Uh, because we have little information about the vulnerability of these, so any additional data that comes to that will be will be fantastic. My last point: um, it is it is really particularly encouraging from my perspective to see the Oxford work to also include other dimensions of risks, not only the physical risks. Um, the uh, if, if, if you look into the main obstacles uh, that prevent more investment flowing into infrastructure, it is in many cases factors such as, for instance, political risk. You know, do power purchasing agreements hold up? And that's where then the com the the collaboration between the public and the private sector, for instance, the multilateral development banks, uh, and risk sharing between these sectors becomes really important. Uh, thank you very much, Ivo, and it's encouraging to hear you. Uh, the quote of the day is, if it is uninformed investment, it's bad investment. And hopefully this work will help us respond to the demand for transparency, help us prioritize, make a business ca case. Uh, we are really running out of time, but I want to give one minute, uh, a couple of minutes to our colleague who has joined us online, Ms. Savina Carluccio from the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure. She's joining us online. Thank you, Kamal. Um, yeah, just uh, maybe on the finance uh, um, points that we're making. So just for me, the opportunity cost of non-investing in, in resilience is, is disproportionately high compared to what you can save from resilient investment. However, investors, as we are you're hearing from colleagues not just now, still require some convincing to unlock dive finance flows, particularly 
uh, in low middle uh, income countries that uh, really require uh, that sort of investment more urgently uh, and at scale. Uh, particularly if we want to um, deliver to global commitments and to the UN uh, SDGs. So um, that there's a role for private finance. Uh, we, 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 just, uh, we just heard it in heard the, the public side, but you know, like the, the role of pub, private finance is, uh, is going to be important. Um, and concessional and blended finance can help reduce risk and increase that private sector confidence where, where there's not a clear picture of credit worth it, worthiness. So the pu public finance, though, has a role in, in providing an environment to encourage that private investment through creation of new markets uh, and to augment uh, the public finance. So just, just to make that uh, final point, that finance definitely is going to be um, key uh, to unlock uh, resilience building. Uh, and, and I really commend uh, CDRI and, and the work from, from colleagues that were heard today uh, that is going to, to just really help, um, help us and help globally uh, make a difference. Thank you very much, uh, Savina, and we look forward to collaborating with you. Your point that finance would be key to unlocking investment in resilience, and that will require a greater understanding of risk and resilience. That's what this all collaborative work is about. With that, we conclude this session. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.